Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP where I spent the last two plus decades of my life. I'm an outwater and I got me a cell phone for the first time in my life. You know, technology was new to me. I've never had one. So when I got it, I didn't know how to do anything with it except call home. And at that time, you know, my wife was going through a lot out here in the world. And I was grateful for the opportunity to be able to talk to her through the cell phone. Because when you get on the uh, phone, the little pay phone in a penitentiary is 15 minutes. Then you have to wait an hour to call back. Each phone call is only 15 minutes at a time. And, you know, I've been getting written up for my phones because I'm on phone restriction. I'm on visiting restriction. So I have to go dance around, get this phone for a couple months, go buy another, you know, take that off, go buy another one. So I'm just doing the uh, hot potatoes with the phone, trying to keep these people from writing me up. But like I said, I eventually just had a conversation with the SIS and told him, hey man, I'm gonna continue to use these phones and call my wife. So you guys can keep writing me up or leave me the fuck alone. And I was grateful that he had enough respect with what I was saying because he knows, he listens to everything that I, that I say on the phone. And he knows I'm not on the phone trying to make hits out here or make, you know, any type of moves. I know better, you know? And he knows that it's just me calling my wife and being a part of her life to the best of my ability. So they eventually left me alone with a payphone. But with the cell phone, I was able to sit up at night and talk to my wife. Like one particular time she was going to pick up her sister from the airport or taking her sister to the airport like at three o'clock in the morning. And I was able to sit in the car and talk to her as she drove to the airport and she drove back like you know, I just find a soft spot in my cell where I can get one bar, lay down, put my beanie over it. So when the CO do their count, they don't see this neon light coming from the phone. And I plug in the ear, my earbuds and I sit there and talk to my wife throughout the night. It was comforting and I was grateful for it, you know? So there's rumors that there's a bunch of cell phones on the compound. But one day in my block, the CO comes in, just a regular CO searching the cell. But I think he got tipped off to search a particular cell. And he ended up searching low in uh, Bun, B, uh, in, uh, in Bun B cell. Bun B is a dude from DC. Low's from New York. They were cellies. They went and searched the cell. And next thing you know, I see him come out and he goes and locks the door. And when they come out of your cell and they lock your door, that means they found something. They call in for reinforcement. So three other COs come into that cell and they're in the cell searching. But a couple other COs are already off on the compound trying to find the individuals that live in that cell and they lock lowering them up. Like, I don't know where he keeps his cell phone. I know he has one because he's the one, that's who I got it from. So I don't know exactly what they had busted in that cell, but I had my suspicions. And then of course it later came out that they found a cell phone in that cell and they locked these two individuals up. I have my cell phone, you know, I keep it at different places. When we lock down, I have it in my cell because I talk to my wife throughout the night. But during the day, I pass it to another unit, or I have it on me on the yard. It's always constantly moving. But nobody knows that I have this cell phone outside of the people that I share it with. You know, I, I allow my friends, people I fuck with, to use the cell phone because they're also making moves. They're using it to con contact the people on the street to make moves so that we can all eat and hustle. <clears throat> so, when we come, so when it comes out that Lowe and them got busted with a cell phone, 
I tell my homeboy, be my homeboy Jay from Seattle, you know, the one, uh, his name is uh, Jerome Henderson, Hanson. Yeah, he left a comment on there and I told him I'm gonna share this story about how we got our phone fucked off. So we had a meeting between the homies in my block. My homeboy fam works in Unicorp. This is around December. In that water, when you come out in the yard, in the distance, you can see the mountains. You know, little mountains out in the distance. At this time, when you look out, there's snow on the mountains. So I tell the homeboys, we, you know, we came together, we had a little meeting. I say, look, man, we need to put this cell phone up because the block is hot right now. And we're not gonna bring it back until that snow melt. So whatever you guys got going on, whatever conversations you had using this cell phone, we need to go ahead and make the last call and let them know that we're not gonna be on this line again until the snow melts. And that was our agreement. So we then turn get in turn we gave the cell phone to fam and ha and have him go take it to commissary where he works and puts it up. Now the one thing about my buddy fam, he's Vietnamese. His name is Tuan Fam. This dude's a borderline genius. Like I've seen him make crazy ass gadgets out of shit. He comes up with these brilliant ideas. You know, I shared you the time that when we were opening up our football ticket, the SIS came and searched our sales. Three went in his cell, three went in mine. I got locked up for two little pin, little syringes. Like they're not bigger than these things. And it was just the tip of it. Fam has 10 knives and about a thousand books of stamps in his freaking cell and they didn't find any of it. So that's just to give you an idea that this dude is pretty clever on how to put up his stuff. Way better, way more clever than me. So we give him the cell phone to put it up in, in, uh, in commissary. And our agreement was, we don't even mention it. We don't even think about it until the snow melts. Well, fast forward a week later, I come into the unit at recall. You know, I'm out in the yard all day hustling. I run my poker table. I help with the dice games that the homies run, whatever. So when I come back in from the yard, my homeboy Jay's got a coat on. I mean, it's winter, but we're in the unit and he's got a coat on. And I'm at my table, it was about 10 minutes before lockdown. So he comes up and he tells me, he goes, hey, I had fam bring me that cell phone back. I said, what are you doing, homie? I said, we, have, we agreed that the snow, that we ain't gonna get it back till the snow melts. He goes, yeah, I know, but I got some pressing issue on the streets right now and I need to make an emergency call. Now I can't really say no to the homie because he paid for most of the phone call. Like we got, you know, I got a discount on the phone. Like I told you, the phone was going between $25 to $2,800. And I got it for two racks. But I don't have all, I didn't have the whole two racks myself. The homie Jay, he's got a little money. He put up 15 of it. And I paid five, he paid 15. So he has every right, every access to that cell phone just as me. You know, it's ours. You know, there's... I mean, there was no differentiating the time, who's get it, when, and get it, that. It's just, it was just ours, you use it when you need it. And he told me he needed that day. So he had fam bring it back to him. I said, fine. I was upset, but like I said, I can't really tell the homie no because he paid the money for it. So he was like, hey, um, you wanna use it during count? And, and then I'll use it tonight? I was like, nah. I said, man, you just do what you're going to do with it. I don't want nothing to do with it. I told you. I don't want this cell phone in this fucking cell or in this block until the snow melt. But like I said, you're going to do what you're going to do. Go ahead and do whatever you're going to do. But usually when we have the cell phone in the block, I take it in during count and call my wife. That's the only person I call. It's my wife, you know, or... The only time I call, I reach out to any other, anybody else. It's not to say hi, it's not to kick it, it's for them to make moves for me. But at this time, I didn't want nothing to do with the cell, I mean with the cell phone. So 
we lock in. I live in 101. They live in 102. Him and Bryson live in 102. So it's my homeboy Jay and Bryson in 102. Me and the homie Semi is in 101. We have a bunch of pork steak that we just got from the kitchen. You know, every time we come off the yard, uh, the homie Beto and uh, Creeper, they're Sereños, they work in the corridor and they're always stealing, you know, meat and vegetables and stuff out the kitchen. And a lot of times we would have a bucket full of either raw chicken or raw pork or raw steaks. That was my new puppy, Kiki. Anyway, so <clears throat> at this time, we had a bunch of carrots and celery and pork steaks. Like I said, I never take naps. I don't even take power naps. Like when I come off the yard, our routine is, you know, we've been out in the yard all day hustling. When we come at four o'clock count, when we lock down, I prep the food. When we come out, we spend the next 40 minutes to an hour cooking. So by six o'clock, 5.30, we're eating dinner and we're just chilling. I don't even leave the block after four o'clock count. I just sit and watch our whatever program we're watching. My stomach's full, my day's over, you know. The only thing I'm doing now is probably getting high and kicking it. So at this time, we got some big ass slabs of pork steak that we need to cut up. And the way we cut it up is we take the razor, you know, a shaving razor, we break it open so it's just a blade. And my celly is holding the, the steaks up while I'm slicing it, you know. Well, as I'm slicing the food, my door pops open, boom. And I see this, uh, these three COs, one of them's got a shotgun. They're in my door, they kicked in my door, they popped my, my door open, they rushed in there and they got the shotgun on me. Like, get on the ground, get on the ground. You know, my cell is holding, the, uh, holding the, uh, the steak, the pork steak. I got the razor blade in my hand and I'm cutting the pork steak. But you know, I'm accustomed to these type of things. So I don't really, I don't panic, I don't, you know, I sometimes I tell my wife that I'm, I feel like I'm in more control, more in my element in chaos than when everything is just happy-go-lucky, you know? So when they kick in the door, I don't lay down. They're like, get on the ground, get on the ground. I don't lay down because I'm not, I don't know what's going on, you know, because they surprise me and I'm not fitting to lay down and have these motherfuckers jump on me and kick my head in. So I don't know what's going on. So I just drop the razor so they don't see that it's a threat. But I turn around and I square up. They're like, get on the ground, get on the ground. Like, man, for what? They're like, get on the ground, for what? And I'm just telling them, for what? You know, and we're, we're in like a standoff. You know, time slows when these things, when these situations happen. But the whole thing from them kicking in the door and me turning around and facing them and squaring off was probably maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds the most. Then I hear another, uh, I hear the radio crack. Wrong cell, wrong cell, wrong cell. So they hurried up on my cell and locked the door. So we go to the window to see where they're going and I can see them cause you know, in our cell, there's a window uh, I think it's a rect, is, is it a rectangle? Yeah, it's rectangle. It's about maybe two feet high and about half a foot wide. So you're just facing, so when you look, you can only stick half of your face in there to see. And I can see him on this side that they're in front of Bryson and Jay's door. So I hear the doors crack, bah! And all I hear is like, uh, Come on, Mr. Jose, move. You know, you're busted, we got you, just move. What happened, the homies next door heard the commotion in my cell and they had enough sense to know what was going on. But like I said, the time they were in my cell until they got called out and went to their cell was probably only 10 to 30 seconds long. So they're at the door with the shotgun, the bean bag, the can, you know, the, their can of, uh, OC spray and everything, they popped the door. But when they popped the door, the homie Bryson P. Jose 
was in the doorway and he's wide. This is not a little dude, but his personality is really bigger than his, than his uh, physical presence. You know, when everybody remembers him, they remember him as this huge Hawaiian. But, you know, at the time, he wasn't as big as he is now. He's pretty big now. But he fills up the doorway. But also, he has a reputation that there's not somebody you want to piss off. There's not somebody you want to get knocked out by. So he's in the doorway. And the CO, SIS Brown, Lieutenant uh, Sarah, Saragoza, and some other Mexican dude, there was three of them. One of them's got a shotgun. The other one got a canister. And Bryson's in the doorway. They're like, come on, Jose. Come on, Jose. His last name is Jose. He's Filipino and Chinese. Come on, Jose. We got you. But Bryson's not budging. All he's telling him is he's standing there. He's like, don't touch me, bro. Don't touch me, bro. What is he doing? He's blocking the doorway while the homie Jay is in the back. Like I said, the cell phone is this freaking fat. And if they're coming in to your cell to shake it down, they're going to find it eventually. But a cell phone is not the important thing. The valuable thing is the chip inside of it. So while Bryson's in the door, keeping the COs at bay, Jay's in the back of the uh, cell, breaking the cell phone, getting the chip out and snapping the chip. And, fl you know, breaking, I don't know if he got a chance to flush it, but he broke the chip to where they can't go in there and find out what was going all the phone numbers and conversations that they've been having. They got me. So anyway, they finally, you know, after he broke the chip, Bryson finally stepped back and allowed them to come into the cell. They take them and put them in one of the um, weight rooms, workout rooms. They, they don't have no free weights. It's just a bunch of fucking treadmills and some bar dips. So they lock them in there. When they get finished locking them up, in that room, they come and get my me and my me and my cell. He sent me, and they lock us in there. You know, every place that you go to, you have to understand that it might be bugged. You know, you're in their house. They have the intercoms are two ways. When they tell you a move, you can hear them saying it, whatever. But at the same time, when you can hear them, they can also hear you. So when we're in the cardio room, I don't say anything. I just look at them and they give me the impression that, you know, they give me the signal that now nah, we're good. Even though they got the cell phone, like my main concern was the chip because that chip is a freaking indictment. You know, I don't know if they can go back and listen to conversations or look at texts or whatever, but it's not something that you want to get busted with. Like I said, this is my first experience with a cell phone. So I don't know what all can be you know, had and, and brought and drawn back out of it. I watch a lot of TV, so I've seen some some crazy stories. Anyway, so we go to the shoe and they put us in the holding tank. You can imagine, I'm heated. I mean, the cat's out of the bag, they got the cell phone. So whoever gave them the information knew what we were doing. You know, when we was in this holding tank, I told Jay that he can comment and repeat this conversation because I'm pretty sure he remembers this conversation. I said, damn, homie, I've been doing this shit on this yard for the last four or five years. They kick in my cell twice a month, try to catch me slipping, and they never, ever got anything from me until now. And the only thing that's changed in my circle is you. But I know it's not you. I know you didn't tell these people because that's self-destructive. That's just, you know, it doesn't make any sense. But I'm telling you right now, that fucking Mexican that you've been talking to, they call him a borracho. I said, that motherfucker, I know it's him. Because prior to this, when Jay had the cell phone, when I come up, when, during, uh, right when we come off account, of you know, we all have our routine, so we're all creatures of habit. When we come out, we all congregate around our table. We all help to prepare food or whatever. Sometimes somebody's off having a conversation with somebody or whatever. 
You know, it's understood. But a couple of times prior to this, when we come out, Jay vanished. And he's not in all, he's not in the cell. I know everybody he fucks with. So I go make my rounds to go see if he's at these spots that I usually know that he kicks it with at. And a few times, I couldn't locate him in the, in the cell block. But he has a cell phone on him, so I know he's somewhere hiding using the cell phone. But I don't know who he's hiding using the cell phone with. I still don't, and I never asked him. But I've also been watching him have this conversation with this Mexican dude they call Baracho. And this dude presents himself like he's part of some organization that has endless amounts of fucking narcotics that makes these moves and this and that. You know, the homie Jay, he comes from money. I don't know, not that his family is rich, but he's been hustling his whole life and he has money. He's not in need of anything in the penitentiary. His locker is stocked up. He has 5,000 uh, songs on his MP. And those songs are like $1.30 a piece. You know what I mean? He's got like 5,000 songs on his MP. He has his locker stacked up. And other people go to commissary for him. Like, he's cool. And he only had a couple years left. You know? So I'm telling him, I say, hey, man. I've been doing this shit for the last four or five years. They kick in my door every month, twice a month, and never ever caught me with anything. They have always suspected me of being involved in, in the things that was going on in the penitentiary, but they never got anything from me. No matter if they stopped me in the walkway, shake me down, no matter if they come and pull me out and strip me out, they've never got anything from me. And I told them the only thing that's changed in my circle is you. And I know it's not you, but I'm telling you, it's that bitch-ass baracho that you was talking to that's got us caught up. Oh, but it don't make no sense. This is what the homie Jay tell me. I don't know. It don't make no sense. You know, he didn't know I had a cell phone. I said, yeah. There's rumors that there's cell phone on the compound. You and him are trying to make a deal on the streets. You know, he knows that you can't get on his fucking penitentiary payphone and tell your people what's, how to make the move and do what this and that. I don't give a fuck what kind of code that you have. If you have not established it from the streets, you're not going to be able to speak your code through these pay phones in the penitentiary and be able to get a clear message and have everybody on the exact same page, especially if you're dealing in tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's only common sense that this bitch ass dude you're talking to know you have access to some other line of communication. Because the reason he brought the cell phone back at the time, because he said he had an emergency situation on the street. He had something stuck up out in Chicago that needed to get moved out, moved out to Seattle. But the whole time, this bitch motherfucker that he's been talking to was setting him up the whole time. He didn't believe me. Well, anyway, the next day they let me out. They let me and my homeboy send me out because they went and shook down our cell. And like I said, they didn't find nothing in my cell because I don't ever have nothing on me. But they kept Bryson and they kept Jay locked up. <sighs> so, a couple of days later, I get a kite from Jay. Oh, but when I come back to the unit, this when I come back to the unit, as soon as I come in, the same bitch ass Mexican dude named Baracho comes into my cell. And he comes in and says, Oh man, that's fucked up. What happened with Jay, man? I didn't even know he had a cell phone or whatever. Those are all for me a sign of guilt. So I tell him, I said, listen, man, if you ask me, I think you're a bitch ass rat. I think you're the reason that I got my cell phone knocked. You know, we're standing up face to face when I tell him this. If he's not a rat, my jaw is supposed to be over here. But this bitch ass motherfucker sat down on, on my bench, on my table, like, and puts his paws up. Oh, no, nah, Mason, man, I wouldn't do that, man. Jay's my friend. 
and say, man, fuck you. I'm telling you, I believe you're a bitch ass rat. Get the fuck out of my cell. I can't prove it. He's Mexican. He runs Spicer. He's a baracho from Texas. He runs Spicer. So my hands are kind of tied because one, I can't prove it. But I know in my heart, everything, my experience, everything's conditioned me that this bitch motherfucker is a rat. You know? So he gets out of my cell. A couple days later, I get a kite from the homie Jay. He writes me a kite. You know, somebody come out of the shoe, deliver it, delivers it to me. And I read it. He's like, hey, and you know, not, I can't relay it verbatim, but the gist of it was like, hey, Mason, man, my bad. And I think you're right. Cause there's a couple other people back here locked up that had a conversation with this bitch ass dude. And they're all under investigation for the same type of shit that Jay's in, under investigation for right now. Like they caught him with the cell phone, but their investigation was, they were trying to make deals on the streets, whatever they were doing. I never asked, I don't care. I'm just mad that my cell phone is busted. But he says, hey man, can you go to this dude, the Baracho dude, and tell him he owes me 2,500 for the move. And I need that money ASAP. So I don't share all the other stuff that was in the kite. So I fold the kite up just where it says, hey, you gotta send this 2,500 ASAP. So I go to this bitch ass dude's cell and this motherfucker is sleeping. I walk in there, he's on the bottom bunk and I poke him, I wake him up. And he's like, huh, what's going on? I say, hey, hey, check this out, homie. Read this. I'm being aggressive because I want him to buck. I'm trying to give myself an excuse to whoop his ass. But every time he just puts his paws up. And, but every time he does that, it's only confirming my suspicion of his guilt. Because if you are a straight up dude, you're not gonna let somebody come and be aggressive to you. You're especially not gonna let nobody call you a rat or a bitch or any of that stuff. I'm, I'm purposely disrespecting this dude because I want him to jump out there so I can bust his jaw, all right? So I poke him, I wake him up. I say, look, homie, this is what the homie says. Read that. He's like, oh man, there's a misunderstanding. I say, man, I don't care about no misunderstanding. I need this money, I need this money ASAP, right? And you know, this was at breakfast. So whatever, they call the yard and I go and I run my poker table. Well, while I'm on the yard, this dude lives in my block, he lives in 2A. While I'm on the yard running my poker table at about 8.30, 9 o'clock, I see this bitch motherfucker pushing a cart with his property across the walk from 2A to four building. You know, I'm running the game and I'm looking, I'm like, like he got an emergency, like move. It's hard to get moved from unit. It's hard enough to get moved from one cell to another cell. It's even harder to get moved from one unit to another unit. You gotta put in a cop out. The person you're moving into a cell with gotta put in a cop out. They gotta review it. It takes about a week to two weeks if it's gonna happen. You know, when I tried to get Bryson moved to my unit from five block, it took us two months. This motherfucker from the time of breakfast to the nine o'clock, eight o'clock, he was already pushing his cart across the yard to 4A. So again, that shit just validates my suspicion. I'm, I mean, it's not a suspicion because I know for a fact that this dude is a fucking jailhouse rat, right? But it puts people off because he's got a life sentence. But a lot of things you have to understand in there, a lot of these dudes that were life sentence are trying to find a way to work their way out of jail. So if they can put enough people in court, the warden, the SIS, the prosecutor can go to the judge and say, hey, this bitch motherfucker right here been helping us, catching, uh, helping us with cases, helping us put other people in jail, Let's cut him a break and let him go home or some shit, you know? But a lot of these dudes with life sentences, you know, in the beginning, they might have been in solid. They're like, man, nah, I'm going to do this time. I'm going to honor my code and this and that. But after a few years in there, they're realizing, damn, I'm going to grow old in here. I'm going to die in here. And that reality shakes them up 
And they're like, man, I don't want to grow old in here. I don't want to die in here. Fuck it. I'm going to compromise my integrity. So this story is going on long. I'm going to share the rest of it with you on the next episode. But what I want to leave with you here, don't matter how much time somebody got, man. If they're desperate enough, they're going to try to put you in their place. Welcome to the USP.